Welcome again to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. Labor unions have been a strong and important part of our economy for a long time, but there has been a reduction in total union membership with a dramatic <coughs> reduction of the steel industry workforce. How about the rest of the union families? What's going on? Here to share his thoughts is Randy Palmatier, Executive Director for the Northwestern Indiana Building and Construction Trades Council. And you may have one of the longest <laughs> organization titles yeah. I've ever had on the show. I know. Everybody calls it the building trades and they leave out construction normally. So, so just get it in there. Yep. So, so a little bit about you, Randy. I mean, well, first of all, you're one of the prominent leaders in the union area up here. I mean, everybody talks about you. So, I mean, they <laughs> Hopefully do. it's always good. Uh, usually it's pretty good. So. That's good. <laughs> Are, is anybody ever in a leadership position when people don't talk badly about them? No, that sure means you're doing your job. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Now, how, how did you get in this leadership role? I mean, how does one become one of the union leaders? Well, I started out in the IBW 697 when it was back in Hammond, where original union hall and uh, training facility was in Hammond. That was in 97, so now right out what, of high school. I know what IBEW is. So the, International know. Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Okay. I'm an electrician by trade. Okay. I got into the union or the apprenticeship when I was uh, 1997 when I was 18, so right after high school. So everybody's calculating your age right now, right? I'm um, 36. <laughs> okay. Probably one of the youngest yeah, elected th leaders. We'll, th we'll talk about that a little bit. But, but it, So you got elected to this how, how many years ago? 2009, I took this job, and uh, I was a business agent, business rep with the electrical workers in uh, 2007 to 2009, and then from 2009 to present in my current capacity. So how old were you when you got elected then? 29. 29? For this job in 2027 20, uh, for the IBW, electrical workers. So is that pretty remarkable? Yeah, you it's you probably mean? the youngest in the history, I'm guessing. I ran for the executive board first and then moved from the executive board to the office. That's pretty fun. Then made a, an interesting decision to take this job. So what was the driving force to make you want to be in a leadership role? Well, I, I, was, I was involved in local politics, not union politics, local politics in the town of Maryville. And I just liked to be involved and help out. And it correlated to the union because we would do uh, rebuilding together programs where we go help less fortunate people with their homes if uh, they don't have the money to do it all the unions would get together, the carpenters, electricians, and I started going to those things and donating my time. Uh, blood drives, things of that nature, March of Dimes. We used to, I was chairman of the March of Dimes walk uh, for the IBW. So after that, I was asked to maybe run for something and be more involved on that aspect of the union factor. And I did, and I won. And then it was uh, kind of, kind of a, not a, I don't want to call it a disease, but I just wanted it. I wanted more of it. So you're, you're following the, the, the two rules of leadership I tell people all the time. First, you got to show up. Yes. And then you got to step up. Correct. So, and you, you do both of those Absolutely. things pretty well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I brought with me today a, 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 a box of, you know, electrical parts and stuff because I figured, you know, it yes. might make you feel comfortable. Well, it's been a while. To, been a while some, since I've... Uh, you know, and I know maybe we just, like, spread them on the floor here or something so, you know, you feel like you're standing on a work site. Is this kind of the way it looks? My, my site was always clean. Oh, yours is clean? <laughs> yeah. Now, aren't you surprised that a guy like me would have a piece of wire this size? Yeah, I really, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> you need a license to actually use that. I know, I know, but... Uh, I. I picked it up from uh, the electrical. Yeah, yeah, that plugs more your speed. Yeah, I, think. I, I actually, I actually love doing electrical stuff. I, it's just one of the things I like to do. Just it's, turn the power off. That's all. It, it's well, easy once you turn the power off. I, I've actually done it both. both live ways. and yeah, I've yeah. done it live. You know, I do, I do it live. Hand. You you you're more attentive when it's live, but we always teach our apprentices if anybody's watching this to turn the power off before turn, you work on it. Turn the power for off for safety reasons. Yes. Well, in the beginning at the beginning of the show, just like, you know, what's the general state of kind of the union movement or in this region? I mean, how would you kind of in the describe region? the, yeah, the atmosphere or the environment of the unions well, at the moment? It, we're, we're getting there. We're getting back, um, obviously, with the passage of right to work, which was uh, a law that was passed in 2012. That essentially, they call it a right to work, but obviously we call it right to work for less. It was, uh, it was a law that was passed that said you did not have to pay union dues, but you still got the same representation, or received the same representation from the union officials. Or, but you and I know, and anybody knows, that's somebody not getting paid for what they do. So how, did, how did that affect? I mean, did you literally have? No, and, and, I, and I'm proud to say okay. to this, to this date, from when they passed that law, 
we've had three or maybe even, I think it was three, it's not more than three, maybe two documented cases in the whole state and they were thrown out of court for no validity. There was nothing there. A few disgruntled members maybe uh, from the building trade side. I can't speak to the public sector unions and some of the other unions that affect it. I think the right to work law affects more of your steel industry, steel worker, factory workers, because they go to one place every day. The, the, the construction trades, a guy can work for three or four contractors in a year. That's why our tax time is kind of rough. You can have five or six W-2s being a construction worker. So it, it, it was a multi-employer plan that we have that's, that differs from somebody who goes to a, a same steel mill every day. So I think right to work would affect them more than, than I'm, us. I'm probably a bit of a student of economics and, and business, I guess, over these years of watching it. And I guess I've always described it. It seems like there's been a time in history that, that the workers were really not treated well and the unions really grew. And then periods of time that business kind of figured it out and tried to treat their workers better. And then unions seemed to maybe retrench or fall back. And then, but I've seen that cycle kind of come and go where in the business side, greed just seems to kick in and they just seem to be treating employees horrible. And then you see organized labor really rise up. But when things are running kind of smooth, it looks like they're kind of taking a little bit of a beating. Does that cycle seem right? No, it is. And it depends on swings both ways, the way I look at it. I've been around a short period of time, not as long as some of my other uh, guys before me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's scary, actually, because the wage disparity, I mean, statistically, looking at the countrywide, not even in the state, the wage disparity between the, the CEO and the worker is still 600% right now. And that keeps getting wider. So when they start passing these laws, we do rise up. We do come down to the state house. Uh, but it's important and incumbent upon us, I think, as labor leaders to uh, educate our, the young people coming into the apprenticeship programs, not only on the trade, but how important it is to vote, how important it is to be uh, politically involved in your community. Because a lot of our, you know, our workers are workers on, during the day, but you know what, they're coaching baseball teams on the weekends, they're taking their kids and their wives out to dinner and to the movies on the weekends. They're, you know, they're human beings. So when you have that discretionary income, you can do those type of things. But, but it's, it's a cycle, I think it is, but it's still, I'll say it again, it's incumbent upon us as labor leaders to educate them in labor history. I think to know, they need to know where we were at, where we started and where we're going, to know what to do and how to react. And I know you're probably going to talk about this later in the segment, but uh, you know, we'll get into the entitlement culture too. I mean, that's... Yeah, that's part of it too. But, you know, it's interesting because, again, going back to that cycle, you know, what it seems like is business kind of gets fat and lazy and yes. old and, and rigid, and, and then that's when things start falling apart. But it seemed like that the unions sometimes go through that too, where the leaders kind of get to a point where they get a little fat and lazy and a little... They get complacent. complacent. I think it's com more complacent this than anything. Uh, doing this job, it, being a business agent for a particular trade or for any, for any union for that matter, you, it get, you're, it's a long day. <laughs> you're getting beat up by the contractors, the customers, the non-signatory uh, members, the, uh, your own members. Everybody's got something to say to you. You know, you're always taking pot shots at you. So all day long, you're kind of in a, it's always a, a tension, tension-filled day. I mean, it's a tenuous day. It's sometimes tough. So yeah, it, it doesn't take long for uh, some of our labor leaders to uh, time to retire or yeah. do something else because you can only get take this job's at a high stress level and a high turnover level also. Yeah, you know that interesting negotiating and so forth. I mean, years ago I was in a business that was related to the construction industry and the owners of the business were kind of one of those, you, you beat up your subs, you beat up your employees. And, That's and, just the business model and, almost in the construction and, industry. Yeah, and you know, and I said, that was a business person I never wanted to be. Do you find people in the construction industry that kind of don't abide by that, who really pretty much try to treat the workers fair and try to treat their vendors fair? Uh, I've worked only in the union sector, mm -hmm. so it's hard for me to to speak on if anybody has, I mean, we, we are, like our, my contractors, uh, I think, yeah, they treat everybody pretty fair. If, you, if they don't, there's, there's avenues and things of that nature, but everybody's a, a person first. So you gotta just, if you follow the golden rule, you're fine. And we teach a lot of that etiquette in, uh, in our management courses that we do offer. And the, the apprenticeship actually teaches management. And if you're a form, foreman training, we have all that. And part of the big, uh, part of that curriculum is a big part of it is the uh, treatment of other people on the project or who you, who you deal with on a daily basis, all the way from the customer on down. 
So if we're working for NIPSCO or ArcelorMittal or, or you know, U.S. Steel for that matter, treating their management and their workers out on the job site is just as important as how you treat your counterpart or whoever you're working with for that day or your boss or how your boss treats you at all. It's all one big, because we're all in this together. We're customer to contractor. That's why we have the tripartite meetings where all those groups get together and hash out if there's any problems on the job site. So we meet quarterly with a lot of the bigger customers. Hmm. So, so you, you know, you brought up the trades these days. A lot of people just don't understand how different the trades are. I mean, you guys are really, particularly, I know the electrical side of this, I mean, tradespeople are very technical. They gotta really understand a lot, but also they gotta understand people and customers Correct. and teamwork. And it's not, it's real different, isn't it? And that's, a, and that's one of our biggest hurdles. I think is making people understand just because somebody says the word union doesn't mean you have your public sector unions from your teachers and your police and fire ambulance and you have your uh, Unite Here unions or you know with the hotel workers, casino workers, then you get to the building, they steel workers, then you get to the building trades. Yeah, we we build things, we got to know what we're doing. We're building 200, you know, look at the four billion dollar BP expansion. You can't send a bunch of people out there that are not educated, don't know their job. We spend over a billion dollars in this country a year on apprenticeship training between all the crafts that I cover. My understanding is, and particularly some of the crafts like the electrical union and so forth, pretty much people are walking into the apprenticeship program with at least a two-year degree or sometimes a four, or they're earning it during that time. We, you can, I earned my two-year degree through the apprenticeship, but right now, yeah, we raised the bar on our testing, and if you have a degree, you will get in easier. The old, and I'll say it, uh, um, public and you know, the old days of the country club, you know, your sons, dads, everybody, all the cousins are getting in, family and friends. It's not happening like that anymore. Uh, we've changed the, our, our, our business model on the union side because we don't want that negative connotation out there. That's how we operate. So Now, is that with all of them? Because I know, I know in the electrical, I mean, it, it is real advanced. I mean, you guys yeah. are doing fiber optic. I mean, and we, we have a five-year apprenticeship, and then we have journeyman upgrade after that. I'm a high-voltage splicer by trade. So I, I needed to go to those extra courses to learn so, that. So you knew that heavy wire. Yeah, you, yeah. You, well, mine, are, mine are about the size of my, my yeah, arm. About your arms. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen those too. So in, is it, are all the trades kind of technical? I mean, particularly in the construction? I mean, is it really, I think, is well, it bar up know, in all of them? Carpenters, everything, plumbers? Yeah, I would, well, I don't, I don't want to call them technical, but everybody has to have, to pay attention to detail. I mean, you're on a job site that you're working around electricity, whether you're an iron worker or a carpenter. Mm -hmm. Carpenter's putting a wall up and the electrician's right there above and running a piece of conduit with high voltage wire in it. They, they have to know their surroundings. So it really comes down to being alert, uh, a safety, it's more safety orientation. We do a lot of safety training. I mean, it's a lot of OSHA 30. Uh, we, have, we have a drug testing program in place for all the trades, BCRC. Uh, we random test, we have rehabilitation programs. So we want to make sure that the quality and the caliber of, of uh, people coming out on a job site is safe. Safety is number one. I think that's, one. A, that's a big issue yeah. uh, is the quality of, of the labor force that you've got that you guys, and you say, when I send you somebody, they're good and they're, we're trying to keep them drug free and all those kind of things. So now I've heard Dewey talk about this. Yes. Our, our, this region recently was kind of uh, recognized as a place that has almost, I mean, our it's Safety a zero, record, was, zero yeah. recordables. Um, we did that BP project with with a low recordable injury rating. We're we are the safest safest in the re, in the state of Indiana, and not only that, we're also we got an award for being safest in the country. So think well, about that from what, the Northwest you, Indiana, safest in the country. Yeah, what do you attribute that to? Because so, so many people here will will say some negative things about our workforce and say, you know, they're just not up to snuff sometimes. But then you hear something like this, you go, whoa. And that's like, first of all, how many people are in the construction trade particularly? We have uh, statewide in the building trades. Okay. We did a study in 2006 when we had the major moves to road work going on with Governor Daniels when he was, uh, when our, was our sitting governor. Uh, we did a census, it was 80,000 statewide, give or take. And I want to say Northwest Indiana was half of that, 40,000. Wow. And I think we've stayed there statewide, or outside of Northwest Indiana and that, at that number maybe dropped a little bit, but I think Northwest Indiana has actually went up a little bit. So, so what? I think we're closer to 50,000 now, 2015. Wow. So, so what is going on that you've got it's this group of people in this workforce that are this good at the safety thing? I mean. We, we, it correlates to our summer contractors can't get jobs. Um, our, 
Our contractors build, like I, I joke and say, a birdhouse all the way to an oil refinery. We can do everything in between. We are the safest, and we, but we are lucky. We have a refinery in our backyard. We have you know, steel mills in our backyard, casino boats. We've worked on it all, blast furnaces, you name it, all the way down to the commercial and the resident. We even still do residential right now. A lot of areas that's unheard of for a, a, a signatory you know, union member to be working on a house because they talk about the price differences. It's, uh, we're still doing them. What do you feel like is one of the challenges for you? Because when I first heard about you and first met you, people would describe you as you know, uh, young and progressive. You know, they say this guy really is going to change the unions. I mean, what were you doing, and, and what are you kind of struggling against that still exists? Hopefully, not a lot of my guys are watching this. My <laughs> leadership. Uh, I was trying to get away from the old, like you said, the old uh, kind of what people thought about the unions. We're lazy. We get. We're overpaid. You know, uh, we're too safe to a point where nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. Type safe. Right. And also, the word union turned into a bad word. Mm -hmm. So I tried to push more. I, I hired a marketing company to come in and, and not from this area. I wanted a, I wanted a third party. I wanted a, a look from somewhere else. So I started changing the word union into local. It's a local, local okay. workers. So I preach now local workers on local jobs equals a strong local economy. That's our so new slogan. So obviously that marketing hasn't worked real well on me yet. So <laughs> since I'm still doing union, but, but I'm going to change for you, okay? Yeah. So, so I, I, local. It's, it's, it's just what, it's power is perception. And that's what the, what they, when they see the picket lines and guys sitting there on lawn chairs, it's, it's a problem for us. They don't know all the underlying issues, but it's still, it's power is perception. That's what's perceived. I'm trying to change that perception because it's not mm -hmm. at all true. Well, one of the perceptions, I think, too, is that if you get unions, you know, as soon as there's a problem, there's going to be a grievance filed, you're going to have to do all this crap, and, you know, so. As far as the building trades goes, we, we seldom have a grievance. Uh, you got to realize your, your Gary up in Hasties and, you know, your, uh, uh, your ton of blanks, they're all, the guys in the office, and, or the men and women in the office are all tradespeople. They come from either one background or another, an iron worker, carpenter, millwright, electrician, you know. They pipe fitter, they all come from the trade. So we understand, we kind of police our own, so to speak. So your foreman on the job or your superintendent all the way into the office can be a carpenter to an electrician to a pipe fitter. So they get it, they understand. I'm on the regional workforce board, so we talk about this a lot of times that there's a lot of good qualified jobs here, and but not the supply of workers sometimes or people eligible to follow these programs seems to be thin. But it sounds like in the building trades, is there kind of a waiting list to get into the apprenticeship programs? It, is there? It, well, it directly correlates, it's directly proportional to what the work picture is. Like right now, after the BP boom, we, we had to scale back. Now with the steel mills cutting again, if you read in the newspaper, I think what was it every other day there was an article saying that this is on idle, the right. blast furnace is idling. All that's scary because a lot of our work is in the industrial sector. So we don't have a set... Uh, uh, you know, like some people we were interviewing today, we, we set that like every month, depending on what it looks like, and that work picture can change in a day. So, so right now, how is it? We, everybody, can, up? we still do a. They can still do an application in any of the trade unions, anytime, and that does go onto a list, and then the list is based on a ranking. So it, they take your written test, your interview, and they basically build a list that also rate you as far as that goes. So right, right now in the in the workforce, I realize we're still coming out of summer. I mean, is everybody pretty much working in the building trades? Uh, uh, no, we're, we're hurting a little bit because of the steel mills. So there is some unemployment. I want to say maybe 30% unemployment, a little bit lower. And that's going to get better. We have some stuff coming up at BP again. Uh, hopefully the mills settle their issues with the steel workers. Is that one of the benefits of being in the local? Did you get that in the local is that when when there isn't work I mean the unions there to kind of support you the locals there to support you yeah I mean well you get your own employment from the state if you're, yeah. you're talking if you're laid off if you're right. an actual member yeah you right. get your own employment then we have a sub fund we call it and it's your money we just it's almost saved for you and then that's a supplement the difference between what you would normally make to your unemployment that that, that all runs out though I mean it's a six-month deal so after that runs out, it's it gets hard on the guy, you know, yeah. hard on the guys because they they have to pay their health care after that. Their health care stops; it's not funded after three months. So, so we're down the last couple of minutes. Yep. So what what do you wish that kind of the general population of this region understood better about what you guys do and what you do? We're highly trained, highly educated. 
we, are, we, we go to work every day, eight for eight, in the construction trades. Our contractors are bidding jobs by the hour. We don't get a lot of the perks that everybody thinks we do. We make a living wage, so we have the discretionary income to make the economy go. I wish everybody would just educate themselves on some of our issues that are going on at the State House as far as the repeal of this common wage is another uh, big blow to us. We're, we're working on ordinances with the towns and cities, but it's all an education process from the, our, our members to the people out in the public. And I wish we would just get out and vote. And vote, vote for the right people that uh, support the local economies in the state of Indiana and make sure our members are working. So the next six months, year, just real quick, kind of what's the biggest challenge you think you're I'm, facing? I'm getting the uh, responsible bidding ordinance passed in most of our municipalities to counter the repeal on common wage, which is a wage that's set for an area standard. Basically, it's the wages that are told to be paid for each classification, like an apprentice, journeyman, worker in Northwest Indiana. They they have taken that out of uh, out of out of the law, basically. So they're telling you, you can, somebody can come in from Alabama at five bucks an hour and undercut our local contractors. So I have to ensure that that doesn't happen. Wow. So I really appreciate you coming on the show. Well, thanks for Honestly, having me. If, if you want to take any of this stuff home with you, you know, I'll be glad to put it in your car. Oh, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good. You, you probably got a garage full of this stuff. Yeah, in fact, I hired a contractor last week to do some work for me because <laughs> I don't have time. There you go. That's good. Well, thanks for coming thanks on the show. For having I really, me. I appreciate, really appreciate it. it. Thanks. 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 Thanks, Keith. Many of us were taught that it was a negative trait or just wrong to be proud. Pride when placing yourself above others or thinking you are better than the next person is not a good thing. In fact, to its extreme, it is awful. Being prideful usually leads to feelings of, I deserve better than everyone else, and actions of treating others poorly. This was hammered into many of us as we grew up, but I think it was created, has created an ex unexpected byproduct. The definitions of proud and pride have become intertwined. Let's take a look at these two words and create some distinction. When used as a noun, pride or proud is a state of being where one shows a high or ex excessively high opinion of oneself or one's importance. I think the noun usage of those words is the most common. Let's take a look at a different use of these words and see how it changes the meaning. How about pride in product? What you build, produce, or provide as a service is created with high standards, excellence, and attention to detail. Consider pride of place. It's presenting the home, neighborhood, town, community, or region where you live and work in a positive light. Pride of place could be shown in your church, school, or work location. Then there is pride of others, where one recognizes and honors the achievement of those around you. Finally, we have pride of self. It is a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own achievements. The second set, pride of product, pride of place, pride of others, and pride of self all require action. You have to work hard, be smart, and innovative to produce something worthy of pride. With place, you must share what is good about your physical space and contribute to its creation, maintenance, or improvement. For others, your verbal recognition and praise combined with your physical cues convey your pride. Self may be the most challenging of all. It requires that you examine who you are, how you behave, and what you can achieve. Then act to reach your goals, make changes, and be the best you can be. We need to consider how we think about these two concepts. I still believe when pride is selfish, it is wrong. The pride and product place others and self where we have to make it happen are good things. Let's not be in the first category, rather let us strive while helping others to be in the second. As always, I want to hear from you. We welcome your comments and thoughts about the content of this program or what is happening in our communities. You can email us at focus at lakeshorepublicmedia.org or watch past Lakeshore Focus shows from our website, which is www.lakeshorepublicmedia.org. Join us next week for another Lakeshore Focus. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today.